Hello, everybody. My name is Felix Ratcliffe, and I work for LD Ford Consultants in Rangeland Conservation Science. I'm going to talk with you today about a project that we've been working on this year to document coastal prairie management at Point Pinole Regional Shoreline that's occurred since 2002. Um, I'll start by talking about some background information about Point Pinole. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about what is coastal prairie. Uh, then we'll talk about invasive species uh, at Point Pinole, and then the Integrated Pest Management Program, or the IPM program, to, uh, to treat those invasive species. We'll talk a little bit about monitoring and mapping efforts that have occurred within the park, and then wrap up with some summary comments and recommendations for the future. So Point Pinole Regional Shoreline is a regional park on the Richmond shoreline, shown here in this green circle. Uh, the park is on a promontory uh, or a point that juts out into the bay and is surrounded on two sides by water and then on the third side by industrial and other development, including a railroad track that runs along the southeast border of the park. Um, beginning in the late 1800s, Point Pinole was owned and managed by several different industrial manufacturers, and the site was used for the manufacture of explosives. It became a park in 1973, but this was after almost 80 years of industrial use at the site. These images are taken approximately 80 years apart, and they show a few interesting things. On the left is an image from 1939, and on the right is an image from 2020. Uh, in 1939, Point Pinole was owned by the Atlas Powder Company, one of these explosive uh, manufacturers. And you can see that there was some fairly extensive development in the central meadow area, this area here in the center of the park, um, and then also along the Point Pinole Trail going here, if you can see my cursor. Uh, here it is zoomed in on that region. And you can see that there were several roads. There was even a little homestead, potentially some, uh, some cultivation around this homestead. In fact, if you see where the cursor is now in the central meadow area, there's still some remnant plants that were presumably planted quite a long time out, out, uh, ago out there, like some roses and other ornamentals. Um, and you can see that in general, there's quite a lot of uh, soil disturbance, ground disturbance, uh, including trails and roads and things like that. Uh, you can also see that the eucalyptus groves that are there today were already established uh, largely in 1939. Here they are shown in these two red circles. However, they have grown in extent over the last 80 years, encroaching on some of the grasslands adjacent to some of these historic sands. Now, despite the history of industrial use uh, of ground disturbance at this site and the introduction of non-native species, Point Pinole remains a pretty good example of fairly intact coastal prairie uh, in California. In fact, in 2013, it was written up as a feature in the Grasslands Journal in their feature called Visiting the Grassland uh, for its stands of pretty nice, fairly intact coastal prairie. So what is coastal prairie? Well, coastal prairie is a grassland type that occurs in coastal areas of California. It generally has significant cover of perennial grasses, such as the native California oat grass, or Danthonia californica, or other perennials like our state grass, purple needlegrass, Stipopocra. Uh, in fact, Stipopocra is what's shown here in this photograph in abundance at Point Pinole. The coastal prairie at Point Pinole has pretty robust populations of California oat grass, purple needlegrass, and some other grasses as well, like creeping wild rye, squirrel tail grass, and salt grass. Uh, in addition to those grasses, there are also several native forbs associated with coastal prairie in Point Pinole. Um, so within the park, coastal prairie can be found uh, throughout much of the areas of the park. It's shown here shaded in green, uh, in that darker, darker green, and inhabits much of the area that is not eucalyptus forest or marsh. Major threats to coastal prairie include invasive weeds, shrub encroachment, and development in agriculture. Thankfully, extensive development in agriculture are not imminent threats at Point Pinole, but invasive species and shrub encroachment are ongoing management issues that threaten coastal prairie in the park. The major invasive species threatening grasslands at Point Pinole can be broken down into different functional groups. We'll start by talking about some grasses. So in addition to the usual mix of naturalized annual grasses, things like wild oats, avena, and some of the different bromes, there are a few particularly troublesome grasses that invade coastal prairie areas of Point Pinole. And these are Medusa head, shown here on the left, 
velvet grass shown in the middle and harding grass shown on the right. These, these three grasses invade coastal prairie. They can change vegetation structure and they can have big implications for coastal prairie plant and animal communities. In addition to those three grasses, there are also several broad-leaved perennial weeds that, um, that are present at Point Pinole. The most troublesome of these are teasel and fennel, shown here. These two herbaceous perennial plants can each form dense stands that outcompete and exclude coastal prairie species. But grasses and herbaceous perennials are not the only threat to coastal prairie at Point Pinole. Woody plants like eucalyptus have also displaced coastal prairie, and a few of the native coastal prairie, uh, excuse me, and very few of the native coastal prairie herbaceous species thrive in the eucalyptus understory. One exception to that is that creeping wild rye stands do occur in the eucalyptus un understory. All right, now also in the absence of grazing or fire, shrubs like coyote brush will start moving into coastal prairie. Uh, coyote brush is a native shrub, but over time as plants encroach and increase in density, uh, coyote brush stands can displace coastal prairie plants. There was a study conducted at Point Pinole by Peter Hopkinson and other researchers at UC Berkeley that found that coyote brush encroachment into coastal prairie happened at the rate of approximately 5% per year. This is in line with other research showing that in the absence of fire or grazing, coastal prairie can be type converted into shrub dominated systems over the course of about 15 to 20 years. Now this is slow enough that you might not see it change much from year to year, uh, but over the course of a few decades, you could lose entire coastal prairie areas to shrub encroachment. A key part of coastal prairie management at Point Pinole over the past 20 years has been an integrated pest management program to control priority weed species. This program was largely conducted by the recently retired long-term Point Pinole ranger, Sushan Rob, who deserves a lot of credit for keeping invasive species at bay in Point Pinole Regional Park. Much of my information about the challenges and successes of weed management at Point Pinole have come from interviewing Sushan, who has a wealth of information on this topic. Um, so some of the stuff that we talked about is that the park has used different management tools uh, over the course of, of the last 20 years or so and found that some of them work better for different weeds in different scenarios. Um, and a variety of treatments have been used over time uh, to combat weeds in the coastal prairie habitat at Point Pinole. The main targets of this IPM work have been medusa head, velvet grass, harding grass, teasel, and fennel, some of those priority weed species we just talked about. But the program has at times targeted less common weeds like French broom and yellow star thistle. In keeping with IPM guidelines, a variety of practices have been used to eliminate weeds, and these include clipping or mowing fennel and teasel, digging out harding grass stands by hand, spot spraying herbicides, especially for teasel and fennel patches, prescribed burning for a variety of weeds, mowing medusa head, and even mobilizing volunteer crews to hand pull or dig harding grass uh, or eliminate teasel or coyote brush. They've even used uh, winter goat grazing as well. Now, this work has not been monitored in an experimental way. Uh, however, the treatments have largely been successful. And this is evidenced by the fact that uh, many of the treated patches have been exterminated and that many of these weeds that have been the target of this IPM program have not spread much through coastal prairie areas of the park while the program has been in effect. Um, not all weed reduction efforts were initially successful. Over the past 20 years, Point Pinole staff have found which practices work best for which weeds in different settings. Most often, um, eliminating these weeds takes multiple years of concerted effort on any given patch, and the timing of the treatment is essential for its success. So one example of this process is that uh, the, point, uh, the park staff initially tried mowing teasel stands, but found that mowing didn't kill the plants and would actually sometimes increase the number of flowers on individual plants, which is, of course, not what you're trying to do when you're trying to eliminate invasive species. Um, however, they found that using weed wrenches to pull up individual plants and also spot spraying with the herbicide Garlon have proven to be successful management techniques. So they've adopted these techniques over time. One of the greatest accomplishments of, of the IPM program has been the early eradication of weeds. There are some weeds that are not major issues at Point Pinole now, largely because they were eradicated early. Um, and these include things like French broom and yellow star thistle. 
So here's a photo that shows an area that was treated for Harding grass. On the left, you can see what it looked like before the treatment. Uh, and on the right, uh, you can see what it looks like after the Harding grass was dug up by hand. All right, one way that Point Panola is unique is that it's had the opportunity to conduct multiple prescribed burns starting in the early 2000s. Between 2000 and 2010, there was a rotating cycle where different fields would be burned once every four years. The fire department helped facilitate this because it provided training for their personnel and the Point Panola uh, staff saw this as a valuable tool for managing weeds and also re restoring some of the coastal prairie habitat. So in many ways, this was a win-win program. In some cases, burning was the first step in successful treatment of a given weed. An example of this was that uh, for fennel, it was found that burning and then following up uh, afterwards with a spray of 2% solution of the herbicide Garlon was really effective for treating that weed. Um, in general, burning was found to be effective for reducing fennel, teasel, medusa head, yellow star thistle, and even blackberry. Um, however, it was not found to be particularly effective against uh, harding grass in the park. After 20, uh, excuse me, after 2010, it got harder to carry out burns in the park due to weather and permitting issues. And then the last few years, it's been especially hard to burn due to widespread spread wildfires around California and their associated air quality issues in the Bay Area. One of the most recent burns was in 2016, and this one was targeted at reducing the weed medusa head in grassland areas of the park. We're going to talk about this a little more later. So in addition to treating those weeds, burning was also very effective for reducing coyote brush. I mentioned earlier that study conducted by Peter Hopkinson between 2009 and 2012 that looked at whether multiple consecutive prescribed burns would effectively kill coyote brush. What that study found was that multiple consecutive prescribed burns did effectively killed coyote brush, and it did so without negatively impacting native perennial grasses in the coastal prairie. I should mention that Peter Hopkinson, who was at UC Berkeley at the time, is now on the staff at the East Bay Regional Park District. And he actually gave a presentation on this study last year to the stewardship seminar. So if you want more information about that, uh, that project, I'm sure you could find that presentation and watch it as well. All right. Now I want to talk a little bit about monitoring and mapping efforts at Point Pinole. So in order to describe the condition of coastal prairie and the effectiveness of these various management actions, monitoring must be performed in a way that can document change in species composition and structure of grasslands. For the weed eradication efforts, there have been some intermittent mapping efforts to document weed patches and also treatment patches. And there's also been some photo monitoring of the treated areas, like the photo that I showed you of the, of the harding grass that got treated. These are really useful for demonstrating what practices were applied where, and to some degree for documenting the success of these treatments. But they don't really show broad scale condition or species composition of the coastal prairie grasslands. However, in addition to the monitoring uh, conducted by the park, there's also been several other monitoring and mapping projects at Point Pinole since 2002 that have specifically looked at grassland structure and composition. Um, several of these studies were performed by the UC Berkeley Range Ecology Lab. So from 2002 to 2004, um, the Berkeley Range Ecology Lab monitored vegetation species composition at several grassland areas around the, uh, the park. I mentioned the 2009 to 2012 uh, shrub burning study. There was also a study from 2016 to 2018 where the UC Berkeley Range Ecology Lab uh, conducted monitoring associated with that 2016 prescribed burn that was targeting Medusa head that I mentioned earlier. These same plots were surveyed again as part of this project this year in 2021. And I'm gonna update on some of the results from that study uh, in a minute. So in addition to that plot-based uh, evaluation of vegetation composition, there's also been several vegetation mapping efforts at the park. So vegetation mapping was conducted in 2009 by Wild Lagarde, uh, who was at the time on the staff of the East Bay Regional Park District. And this was done again in 2018 by Nomad Ecology. In the latter survey, Nomad also sampled vegetation at 33 different plots using the rapid assessment and releve method. So altogether, there's quite a bit of fairly detailed species composition and structure, structural information for, um, for grasslands within Point Pinole Regional Shoreline. 
All right, so a minute ago, I mentioned that we revisited some of these Medusa head burn plots in 2021 that had originally been surveyed in 2016. Uh, and that original survey was right before a controlled burn occurred that was intended to control Medusa head in the park. Here's what we found when we looked at those plots again. First of all, we found that the burn was very successful at reducing Medusa head and that that reduction has now lasted for five years. The graph here shows frequency percent of Medusa head in the main infestation area north of that central meadow area of the park. Um, it was about 20%, you can see up here, it was about 20% frequency before the burn. After, after the burn in the following year in 2017, that was reduced to only 3% frequency in the burn area. So that was quite, quite a good treatment effect. And then if you follow that time series out, you can see all the way down to 2021, when we resurveyed this year, we found zero Medusa head plants in the burn area. Um, so it should be noted that this patch has had some follow-up attention from park staff who went out and actually hand-pulled individual plants. This was especially important on the edges of these treatment areas where the Medusa head was edging from the grassland habitat into the eucalyptus that, that sort of edged this grassland patch. Um, and the eucalyptus wasn't part of the control burn. So it was really important to get in there and actually hand-pull some of that stuff so it wasn't a seed source to reinfest the, the field. Um, but this also highlights how burning can be part of a multi-method attack on weeds. The burn killed most of the Medusa head in this area, which made it then feasible to go in and hand pull the few plants that appeared in subsequent years. After that 2016 burn, so in that same year, right after the burn, uh, we collected seed heads that had been burned in the fire and also some that had not been burned to test germination in the lab. We tried germinating 100 burned and 100 unburned seeds. And at the end of one week, what we found was that 97 of the 100 unburned seeds germinated, whereas none of the burned seeds germinated. And this showed the value of having a well-timed fire that could kill those seeds uh, while they were still being held up above the ground by the, by the uh, plant. All right. So we looked at the effect of the burn on native grasses as well. And what we found was that the burn did not have a clear or consistent impact on different perennial native grass species at Point Pinole. Both California oak grass and purple needle grass seemed to decrease in the year following the burn. But this may have also had something to do with weather in that year as well, although there weren't any sort of obvious weather, weather patterns that were associated with this. In the case of California oak grass, uh, shown here in this top graph, graph, the cover never really uh, rebounded to its pre-burn percent frequency. However, if you look then at purple needle grass, you can see that the, the percent frequency of purple needle grass has rebounded now to above what its original or pre-burn percent frequency was. So the fire certainly seems to not have had any long lasting negative Im impacts on purple needle grass. Whereas for California oak grass, it's hard to say, but perhaps there have been some uh, negative effects of the burn. One species that we encountered regularly during our transects was the non-native annual grass Brachypodium distachyum, or purple false brome. Purple false brome is a fairly short statured grass that many land managers and researchers have observed spreading in the Bay Area and around other areas of California in recent years. Um, as a result, it increasingly causes concern to land managers and was in fact one of two invasive species mentioned in that nomad ecology mapping report as priority weeds that deserve attention in Point Pinole Regional Shoreline. Uh, the other priority weed that they mentioned was English plantain, which is also widespread in coastal prairie areas of the park. Purple false brome thrives on fairly nutrient poor soils, which is a habitat preference shared with purple needle grass and also some other uh, native herbaceous plant species. This bottom graph here shows the relationship between purple false brome cover and uh, the frequency of stipopulchra at the different plots. This is averaged over all the different years. And you can see that there's a positive relationship between these two things, which indicates that these two share some niche preferences and therefore potentially compete with one another. The top graph here shows average purple, purple false brome cover on those same monitoring plots. And you can see there was a big decrease after the 2016 burn. Although purple false brome wasn't the target of this burn, it's possible that this burn was pretty well timed to reducing uh, cover of purple false brome because it happened again when those seeds, it was the burn happened in early June when those seeds were still being held up above the ground. They hadn't shattered and fallen to the ground, much in the same way with the, uh, that the Medusa head was still holding those seeds above the ground. And therefore the seeds were exposed to the fire at the time of the fire. Um, 
However, I will say, um, despite these potentially encouraging results, there is not much information on tried and true methods for eliminating purple false brome. And um, one thing that that might mean is that given the ability to conduct prescribed burns and a, and a whole array of different management practices at Point Pinole, including things like goat grazing and herbicide application, Point Pinole may be an ideal location to actually study treatment methods for, uh, for, for purple false brome in coastal prairie ecosystems, which could yield really useful management information for managing the species going forward. Uh, to wrap up, Point Pinole has diverse coastal prairie habitats that include many perennial native grass species. Threats to this habitat include uh, invasive species and shrub encroachment. The park staff have run a really effective IPM program over the last almost 20 years that, have, that has had uh, you know, big implications for reducing weeds over that time period. Looking forward, it's gonna be important to continue to eradicate these priority weeds, teasel, fennel, harding grass, velvet grass, and medusa head. But in addition to that, the park should consider management of uh, purple false brome. In the long term, continuing to limit encroachment of eucalyptus and coyote brush um, are good priorities. And it's been shown now that the prescribed burn program has been effective for reducing coyote brush. So if it is possible to continue that program going forward, uh, that would be fantastic. Um, in addition to all these management practices, it's gonna be important to have uh, a monitoring program that can monitor vegetation response to all these different management practices so that park staff know what's been effective over time and can um, ad adapt to management going forward. So, so with that, I'd like to say thank you very much and I look forward to taking your questions. Okay.